Very exciting to see how many people joined us today. My name is Shani and I work for uh, Fiverr on Endco Marketing. And I'm very, very happy you can join us today. Uh, this webinar uh, goal is to give our community to you, uh, freelancers and small businesses, just a few tips and tools on how to adjust your business activity to this new or maybe not so new situation we are all, the whole world is in. Um, and the speaker who will lead the, uh, this webinar today, his name is Salim Holder. He's a digital marketing expert with vast experience working with many, many types of businesses from small startups to Fortune 500 brands. And he's also a, a Fiverr Learn instructor in our online course platform. Uh, so I hope you will enjoy the webinar and will benefit from uh, uh, Salim uh, experience and information he will uh, share with you. Uh, so Salim, handling the lead uh, to you. All right, well, welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here today, excited for the opportunity to work with Fiverr uh, and Anco today on this specific um, webinar. So I'm gonna jump right in. I think the reality is that today is a completely unprecedented type of environment and atmosphere. And a lot of things that we're going through, whether you're a freelancer, entrepreneur, whether you're a solopreneur, we're all in this environment where we're trying to figure out how do we maintain our customers? How do we grow more customers? How do we get customers or clients who may be a little bit more hesitant? Or how do we increase more traffic to our website, et cetera? And, I'm, and honestly, as we, are, as we go through this overall uh, webinar today, I'm really approaching this from the perspective of being uh, not coming from a place of abundance. Um, not coming from a place where you might not have tons of money or you might have to control your expenses a little bit. And so as we talk about and go through things today, I'm really talking about how do you increase your overall revenue? How do you get more clients? How do you generate more profit? And how do you do it in a way that really resonates given the way that the world is happening and the way that things are going today? So let's go specifically and look at the three things I'm going to talk about today. So from a fundamental perspective, number one, I'm talking about getting found online. How do you get found online? And this is just a, a fundamental thing, but more people are searching. So we'll talk about that. So one, you got to get found online, make sure you can be found. Second, we got to invest in key areas. And then third, invest in key areas. So you might have downtime. You might have times that may be a little bit different than it had been in the past. So now you can use that time to invest in key areas that will help your business grow. And then the reality is that the way things are today and the way things were yesterday is not how things are going to be and continue to be at the end when this whole thing is over. And so we have to make sure that you're preparing for a new day and you're preparing for something different. And I'll be very honest on the upfront, some of this stuff looks super fundamental and super basic. But I can tell you that I've grown businesses, million dollar brand, $500 million businesses to startup businesses. And a lot of times the, the, the real key to actually changing and unlocking their growth is the fundamentals. It's not advanced tactics and techniques. It's the fundamentals. It's getting the basics done right. And so we're going to just talk about uh, some of those specific things today that we can do to be able to help get the basics right. Starting off, let's just talk about search, for example. Um, to start about search, search is surging. As more people are home, as you obviously know, more people are home, more people than ever are searching. And the reality is they're searching for different things. And where things might have been uh, one way for your business before, maybe it's maybe uh, your, your business is, things are working well for your business. But the reality is that there has been a significant surge and businesses are doing things different. They're operating from home. People can't go to the same stores they used to go to, work in the same places they used to work or connect with the same people they used to connect with. So fewer opportunities do you have to sit and overhear somebody talking about an amazing new product, service, or consultant that you can work with to help drive your business or be able to grab new clients. You're seeing a significant surge, over a 90% surge in office supply searches, a 40%, over 40% surge in beauty and personal care searches. If you're, if you're a business management or consultant, there's over a 23% increase in people trying to see how do I operate and then navigate in this new environment. There's over a 10% increase in searches for nonprofits. Now, I only identified a few of the specific businesses that are seeing a significant surge in search but there's a ton of other businesses out there and categories that are seeing a surge. At the same time, there's some that aren't seeing that surge. So how does that matter? How is that relevant for us? Well, it's relevant for us because it means we probably are gonna have to approach our businesses from a different perspective and do things a little bit different than maybe we have done them in the past. And that means that we need to be able to show up when people are actually searching for our products. 
And when we look at on the right side of the screen, if you can see the right side of the screen here, you can see on the top for this is just a basic search engine results page. We've all seen this page before. And you can see on the top, you can see the ads. And on the bottom is where the organic search results are. And if you're trying to figure out how can I market and, and connect with people in this search environment where search is surging, you might actually be inclined to focus on paid search ads. But as I said at the beginning, not to say paid search ads are bad, but as I said at the beginning, I'm actually talking to people who may not be operating from a place of abundance. You might not have a budget where you can actually put into paid search ads. But if you actually look on the left-hand side, you actually see how it's even more important to focus on the organic search results to make sure you're showing up for free when people are actually searching and engaging this new environment where there's a lot more search happening. 85% of the clicks on this search engine results page are for organic listings. 86% of people, of tr searchers, trust the organic listings more than they do the paid listings. And the positions one, two, and three, you can only see positions one and two on the sheet right here. Positions one, two, and three bring in 61% of all of the organic search traffic. So that's almost 90% of people, 90% of clicks are for the organic listings. And more, and since more people are searching, a free way, a low cost way for you to actually show up in search is to optimize your site to be able to be found when all these people are, are doing all this organic search. So the point is, when you see this amount of men, this many people focusing on, org, on organic search, that then says, this is what you need to do in order to improve your performance there. So we say specifically, this course today, this class is not meant to be a theoretical, hypothetical course. It's meant to be very practical. You should be able to take things from this and execute them right away. So if you want to improve your organic search results, well, I, I would recommend there's courses, there's other work you could do to go way deeper on SEO. I'm just going to give you a couple basic things to consider. Number one, we got to understand how do, how, do, how do we end up in the top of search in the first place? Well, one play that we end up in the top of search, if you think about it, these bots, these, organ, these, these AI bots, these spiders that Google sends out to crawl the web, they essentially look at every single web page that's on the web and they will index that website. They'll say, this is what the page is about. They'll look at images, copy, et cetera. So you probably wanna know then, what specifically are these bots looking at that I can optimize to improve how easy it is for my site to be found in search? It seems super fundamental, but your page title, your page title is the most important, one of the most important things when it comes to SEO. This is one of the most important indicators for Google search to be able to find your website. And again, you might look at this and say, oh, this is super fundamental. I know what a page title is, but I would say about 80% of the people and brands I've worked with, small or large brands, may understand a page title, but may be using them completely wrong. The reality is when you think about that page title, that page title should tell you exactly what this page on the web is all about. Too many of us have page titles that say about us or home or contact us. And I want you to think how many people are actually searching for about us? or home, or contact us. So when we think about it, we want to put the primary keywords that people are actually searching, we want to put that into our page titles, because that is how the Google bots, they see our page and they say, oh, this site is not about, about us, this site is about home improvement products, or this site is about spiritual uh, consulting, or about search engine marketing. That's what this site is about. So when somebody actually types a search query in, and as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot more people are searching, they type that search query in, you now significantly boost the opportunity for your page to be found and listed as a part of that search. That's a free change that you can make immediately. So the idea is that you prioritize the top keywords, the most important keywords you will put into that page title. That page title is right here. It's the blue link that you'll see when you do an organic search. And your page titles also can be seen at the top tab of any page or any website. So you can go on your own website right now and get an idea. Are you one of those websites that has an about us uh, or do you have a more descriptive um, page title? And now's the time as we think about what people are actually searching and looking for, you might want to re rethink the description that you're actually putting in that title to ensure that you're actually delivering on what people actually need. The other part is what we call our header tags. Header tags, these are your H1, H2, H3s. Another way to say it, these are your main headlines on the page. The main headline on the page, this is something you can also change right now. You might have had a headline that you've had on your website this whole time, but it's a new environment. 
And the bots are going to look at this page and saying, based on what people are searching for, is this authoritatively answering a question that people are searching for? How the bots know is by your page title and by your headline. Your H1 is the most important headline that you would have on your page. Your H2, your H3, those would be the second or third most important headlines. And the bots will look at those headlines and, and help index your site in priority order. Your H1 will be the most important. You want it to be descriptive and complementary of your page title. They, should, they could be the same or they could be different. Either way, they got to work together to be able to better describe what's actually on this page. This is how your websites and your pages can be found quickly through organic search. Just to mention for some of us out here who maybe have, have not done SEO before or maybe be somewhat familiar with it, I just left a slide here. We can also send some of these slides out later um, where you could just click and see uh, if you have a WordPress or Shopify or Wix or Squarespace site, where can you go right now to change and adjust your page titles? You can change this, like I said, immediately. You could change it right away. In addition to the focus on your page title, there's quite a few other things. Like I said, I'm talking at a super high level, some basic things you could do right away. But when we think about search engine optimization and getting our sites found, the important part is that we air, look at our websites and make sure our site is actually answering a question that people would actually ask. So when we think about it, instead of thinking about uh, you know, a, a page, I've seen page titles or pages that say number one men's grooming brand in the world, but nobody's searching for number one men's grooming brand in the world. They're searching for how do I stop myself from sweating when I go on this run, when I go on this run, or how do I stop my 12 year old son from stinking who's going through puberty, right? Those are the type of questions that a deodorant brand might ask. So those are the types of answers that you'd want to be able to put on your website. And you want to make sure that you're taking a consumer centric approach to answering questions that people have versus thinking a, a, a customer, a business centric approach, just to touting everything that you're about. So review your website. Are you answering questions on your website that are relevant that people would actually ask? And are you answering it in a way that's authoritative? The Google bots will see that and they will help to increase your, your page presence. Also, conduct keyword research. Now, there's uh, plenty of tools you can use to conduct keyword research. Google, Google Keyword Planner is one. Uber Suggest is another. But keyword research is you actually researching the specific words that people are actually searching that might be relevant to your brand. What words, when people search, do you want your website or your page or your service to be able to show up as the answer to? So we do keyword research so we don't have to guess. We could take a consumer-centric approach, understand specifically what are our consumers looking for, what words are they actually typing in. I will then prioritize those words and put those words into your page titles. Put those words into your main headline on your page. Put those words naturally into the flow of your content. The other part is after your site is able to be indexed and it's easy to be found, well, people are going to start showing up on your site. And when they get there, you got to make sure you actually have content that's answering their question. That's talking about high value content, content that people want to share, that they want to come back to, that they want to spend their time on. And after you have that high value content, how you improve your overall presence is by finding other links, other sites that will link back to your content because that shows Google in a very credible way that it's not just this site that's saying that they have everything and that they're a great site, it's other people who are linking back to that site. So if you already have amazing uh, headlines and amazing page titles, then how you can, and you already have amazing content, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, then you could spend more time actually looking into websites that can link back to your content and that will share your content and link out for it. And so these are just different things that you can focus on based on where you are in your business. These are things that you can focus on that you can do today to be able to start to improve your overall presence. I will preface and say that SEO does take time. It's just because you make the change today doesn't mean that it's going to work out for you right away. However, if you're going from a page title that says about us to a much more descriptive page title that uses um, headlines and keywords, it's way more likely you're going to see results much quicker um, than some of the other smaller changes that you can make. So that's step number one about getting, making sure your website Salim, can be found. Uh, I will just interrupt because we have yes. a few questions here. So if you can go to oh. the chat, I will... Uh... Maybe before we will go to the next uh, stage, to the next uh, subject, we can answer yes. some questions from, uh, from the chat. 
So Eddie is okay. asking if you have any recommendation, which website is better for SEO uh, from the one that you presented, WordPress or Adobe Portfolio website, is there differences? Yeah, so um, there are differences. I can't say that any site is necessary. Well, some sites are set up in different ways and they're meant for different things. So obviously like Shopify is set up for e-commerce. WordPress was a site that was set up for blogs and copy. Um, you can optimize any site. So it's really about looking and some are just easier to optimize and some of them are harder to optimize. So the ones that I gave here, WordPress, Squarespace, Wix, and Shopify, I only chose those just as those are some of the most popular sites that I find most people have. Um, so that's the only reason why I selected those. But I, I really think it's some of the platforms are easier, um, but more than anything, it's the, it's the approach that you take towards identifying the right keywords. It's the approach you take towards structuring your site the right way. That'll go way farther um, than just the platform that you're on, if that helps. Great. We have another question. Do you have any uh, keyword search tool that you can recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, there's two that I, I use often as Google Keyword Planner and Uber Suggest. Both of them are absolutely free tools. Um, there's a number of other tools out there. One in, in particular is um, SEM Rush. So SEM, Search Engine Marketing. I think that's what it stands for, but it's SEM Rush. You can actually do keyword research. You could see what your competitor keywords are. What keywords are your competitors using? What are they paying for? So you can use that um, to really help you to do your own keyword research. Maybe you can uh, write it on the chat so everyone... Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I think it will be uh, helpful. Uh, also, uh, I just want to make sure that everyone knows we are rec uh, recording this webinar and we'll send after the webinar uh, the recording. Uh, and the webinar is not just about, because I see here a comment uh, for SEO, but SEO is one tool uh, that can help you scale your online assets. So this is the first topic Salim is going to cover. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we have like a special treat for uh, people that will stay all the way. So stay tuned. It's like really worth waiting for the end. Um, and then I did see one question just about backlinking and the way that it works. Essentially, it's just when you have another site that links back to your site, you can literally call them on the phone, email them, ask them, hey, can you um, link back to our site? A lot of times you can do it through blog articles. So you guest blog on their site or they'll put a link in, in another article that they have um, on their site, social media links. Those are also backlinks that can come back to you. So those are just different tools and tactics um, that you can use to actually get backlinks. All right, so point number two is when it comes down to, great Salim, I get it, I gotta have my site be found. When your site is found, you also then have to make sure you're creating content, high value content, content that people care about, that they wanna share, that they wanna come back to. And so in order to do that, we have to make sure that we understand what is high value content in the first place. And it's not just creating content, sitting in a room saying, hey, Mother's Day is coming up. Let's come up with something for Mother's Day. It's truly taking a consumer centric approach to marketing, which says, if I want people to act, and honestly, this isn't even a marketing thing. This is a life thing. If I want people to take an action, I have to give them something of value. All of you are taking time away from your day today to be on this webinar because you believe there was something of value that you would get from this call. And so if you want people to interact with your content, you have to give them content that is something of value. And given the extenuating circumstances that surround where we sit today, and that is the reason that we came together today, there may be new value propositions or new ways that you can provide value to your same customers and clients that didn't exist just a week ago. So the importance here is that you may have a super tight understanding of who your company is, of who your consumer is, and of who your business is, but you may then need to take a second to actually look at the value proposition. The value proposition is your way of articulating clearly, concisely, in a way that is as hard for anybody to misinterpret what value you offer to your particular customer. You may have different segments of customers and may have different value propositions for each. Here, I have a specific framework that you can use to be able to create a statement that is able for you to identify and define what your, uh, your value proposition is. You know, for just a second, the importance of this is this. I know a lot of you out here probably are like, I know what my company is. I know what we do. And in some cases, this isn't necessarily being written down for you. 
it's really written down when you go to your graphic designer who's going to create ads for you or when you go to another uh, search engine agency or when you go to another partner, you're going to want to make sure that they have the same understanding of the value op proposition that you offer with zero opportunities for misinterpretation. You want them to clearly get the same thing from you. In order to do that, you got to write it down clearly. And also by us writing this down clearly, it helps us to really reinforce some of those key areas and actually do some of the work ourselves, the research ourselves to tighten up some of these areas. So the way that this proposition works is you would look at it and say, for your target customer who has this particular need, our product, service, or brand is the product or category that gives you this benefit or answers that need. So let me just show you as an example. So this is Find Your Plug. It's my digital agency. So it says, for freelancers, e-commerce companies, and online businesses who seek to increase organic traffic to their website without the high prices and complicated, hard to understand reports, Find Your Plug is the premier digital and SEO agency that translates deeply technical insights into actionable on-site and off-site tactics that consistently outrank the competition in organic search results. Now, this is the value proposition as I used to speak to it as I've always spoken to it. But now in the way that things are kind of changing and adapting, I might actually look at this and say, is there a different need? Is there a different who? Or is there a different that? In other words, that specific point of difference or that specific benefit that I can offer now that would be even more valuable to somebody than it was just yesterday. So once I understand what that value proposition is, and I'm crystal clear in understanding what my proposition is, how I will deliver value, I want to create content. So we need to create content that will answer how we've defined what value we're going to offer. So we call this high value content. This is the content marketing honeycomb. You're going to look at your content and you're going to look at your content and say, what we have actually found is that high value content is actually has these six characteristics. Now, not all high value content has all six of these specific these particular characteristics in this honeycomb. But what we found is the content that's more likely to be shared, more likely to go viral, more likely to people to spend their time on or come back to, will have two, three, or four of these characteristics clicked off. It's participatory, which means it's something you want to engage with. That's like a tool. That's like a survey. That's like a, 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 a what color is your, or what, what celebrity do you look like kind of quiz or like a mortgage calculator tool. Your content needs to be entertaining, makes me smile, laugh. It's something I wanna come back to, it's unique. There's nothing like it, it's different. Or it's meaningful, meaning it taps into things I value, things I care about. It's educational, teaches me something new or helpful, helps me do something cheaper, easier, quicker, or faster. And so when we think about creating our content, we wanna create our content through this lens of making sure the content we create is high value by checking off these criteria or these characteristics. But we want to answer the questions, what are the needs and challenges of this particular consumer? What kind of information are they looking for in the first place? How can you create content that they want to spend their time on? So audit your current content and look at it and say, can you improve it? I guarantee you can improve it. All of us can improve our content. If it's already participatory and entertaining, how can you make it participatory, entertaining, unique, and helpful? So the point is, today, we have more people searching than ever. When you get your site found, you then want to have high-value content that they want to come back to. That's how you get them involved and get them engaged to have them coming back more and more. So when you're thinking about where to post this high-value content, the main takeaway I want you to have from here, there's a number of places that you can post content. But just as a number of you are probably on more than one social media platform, we have to think about just because you're on a platform doesn't mean that, that what you're looking to consume a certain type of information on that platform. So when you're sitting here and then you've defined what your value proposition is and you've defined the content that you're going to be able to use to, to help reinforce that value proposition, when we figure out where we want to put it, it helps to figure out strategically how are you, how are you putting it out? Are you in a position where you want to be a thought leader, where you want to say, hey, let me tell you how to operate in this new environment? Let me show you the best ways to, to create graphics or the best way to do social media content or the best ways to stay grounded and, 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 and healthy. Or are you trying to create a community of people and bringing people together to discuss and share certain things? Or are you trying to tell the story of your brand? The reality, the point I'm making is that when you come with this high value content, you will be strategic about where you put that content out. Just because everybody's on TikTok doesn't mean that you got to be there. 
So the point is, if you focus on where your consumers are, you'll use the right social media channels. You don't have to be on all. You'll leverage the right channel that's designed for the best use case that you're trying to target. And then you'll be able to line with best practices, the cadence, the time that you, that, you, that you put it out there. You'll be able to line that and you'll be able to optimize it over time. But the point is you want to be able to post this high value content in the right places that it will be easily consumed. Not just places where people are, but where they are and they're consuming this type of information. The things you do on LinkedIn, I guarantee are different than the things that you do on Facebook or the things that you do on Snapchat. And then the other point is just want to give you a couple examples. So a couple of examples, um, for example, of, of adapted content of people who are saying, you know what, I've been able to come up with a new way to position my business and give content in the new context of how people are living. One example is D nice DJ. He's a DJ. As, as you know, most places shut down, you probably shut down where you are. You can't go to restaurants, bars or anything. Well, I'm also a DJ and I know that there's way less places that I'm DJ right now because there's no bars open. D nice said, you know what? I do recognize that people still have a need. They might not go to the bars, but what I do recognize is that people are at home and he called it club quarantine and figured out a way. Now he can post uh, through Facebook live and do a, uh, do a DJ session through Facebook live. And he actually turned it in a way that he can monetize it by taking donations, by taking tips and actually putting 50% of that going towards the coronavirus fund. So if you can imagine, forget about the money he's getting today, he's exponentially increased the amount of money that he will be able to get later on when he's DJing at any restaurant, any bar, or any event. In addition to that, he's expanded and kept his, his name top of mind. Another, another example of this are brands that are from like, you have graphic design brands, you have interior decorating brands that have said, you know what, we will actually adjust and recognize that people have different needs today. Everybody's at home doing Zoom conference calls. That's what we're doing right now, Zoom chat. And so they said, you know, we can actually come up with backgrounds that will class up your overall, uh, your Zoom chat. That's another way for these businesses to be top of mind and also to showcase their ability. Tom Shoes, in a much more practical sense, says, hey, people are more likely to be home. We're going to adjust our advertising, talk about the slippers that you can use when you're working from home. And they gave a discount. So the point is there's different ways that you can engage your clientele. There's different ways you can engage your audience to get them to be excited uh, and to get them to tie into what it is that you're offering. Them. The other part, when I just talked about investing in key areas. So when I talk about investing in key areas, when I'm talking about content, I realize that, and I, I've, I've fell and fall prey to this myself. You go to my Instagram page right now. You're probably like, wait a minute, this guy's a consultant. This guy does this because I don't have much content on there because I haven't had the time to create and put content or haven't better yet, I haven't taken the time to create and put content on there. So now we got downtime. Maybe you don't have as many clients. Maybe you have, maybe business is a little slower. So just because business is slower doesn't mean it's time to curl up into a ball. It means there's other things that you can focus on to help grow your business. So that means you can focus on creating killer content, but you can also focus on analytics. When you do all this SEO work, when you put this content together, you're going to want to know, is it working or is it not? And so it's important for you to understand the analytics. If you have never used Google Analytics, now's the time to use it. If you don't know your social media analytics, your email analytics, or any other customer relationship management tool analytics, whatever analytic tools that you can use to help define and help you determine what's working and what's not working, if you haven't used them, learn to use them now. This will be, it's like, it's like driving down the street with no lights on, right? Once you put the headlights on, all of a sudden you can say, oh, there's a pothole. Oh, I'll swerve. I'll take a left here. So you need to have analytics because analytics is like putting headlights on the business. It tells you what's happening, what's working, what's not working. And then you can be able to make much better decisions and get more for the same amount of money that you're putting in. Take online courses uh, or tutorials. So we're going to talk about an online course that I have a second, um, I, I, that I have um, talk about the on online courses on Fiverr, but there's a number of other places that you can take online courses. There's free YouTube videos, but I highly suggest that you look at certain areas that you need to improve on and lean into those areas and learn about those areas and figure out um, how you can specifically get better at those particular areas. On the right hand side here, I also have this chart that just highlights this whole uh, idea around conversion optimization. And the point is just saying you can get more from the same amount that you're investing. This chart here just looks at, said we did a paid search ad, which drove 750,000 people to the website. 
they all went to the product category page and they saw the products and 10%, 75,000 clicked on a product, put it into the shopping cart. And out of that 75,000, 3,750 moved on into the checkout and 1,500 of those checked out. So initially, if I weren't to look at any metrics, I would just say 750,000 people came to the site, 1,500 purchased. Oh my God, we got a problem. But what I'd look at and say, I don't know where to fix the problem. But when we break it down this way, we can go specifically to there's a problem in the shopping cart. There's no reason 30, 75,000 people clicked an ad, went to the site, clicked on a product that they saw that they liked, went into the shopping cart, and 72,000 or 71,000 of those people decided I don't want anything. There's a problem in the shopping cart. If you fix, fix that problem in the shopping cart without spending more money, you can double, triple, maybe even quadruple the amount of sales that you have. So the point is that you need to take the time to upskill and upgrade your tools, your software, your systems, and your tools to be able to optimize what you already have. Maybe you don't have as many clients. Maybe you have fewer people coming to your site. Doesn't mean that your sales has to go down the same way. It might mean you might have to shift and put emphasis on other specific areas. And to the last point I'll make, and then we'll open up for questions, is that things are going to be different in the future. And as things are different in the future, you're probably already seeing, here, here's the thing. I have an e-commerce business. The e-commerce business was doing okay. As of the last three weeks, we have seen over 450% increase in sales on our site. It's been amazing to see that, because, but the reality is because people can go to stores. Their stores are closed. Amazon's not delivering this stuff anymore. These places they used to go to are not delivering. They're not doing this stuff anymore. And so we've started to identify new gaps and new ways that we can bring people into our site. But it's changing all kinds of behaviors across the board. For the first week or two, people say, I could hold off. I could try to, but now people are trying to figure out how do I adapt? How do I adjust? And so what I recommend for you is think about your same current business and you might have new gaps that you can fill. You might have new needs that you can deliver on. And then you can also look at updating, creating or revising your business plan. If you have a business plan, you probably want to go back and, and look at it again. If you don't have a business plan, now you got some downtime, create that business plan. Because when this, this time is going to go by, this time will end. And when it ends, a whole new future will be there for us. The question is, are you going to be a part of that new future that's going in the positive direction? And that means, are you using the time now right, which I would already say those of you who are on this call right now clearly are. So are you going to be in a position of success later on? So take time to update your business plan, create a business plan, revise your business plan, et cetera. All right. So questions. So I see a couple questions. Um, so my, my e-commerce company, it's, a, um, it's the largest Black-owned online beauty and hair supply company in the U.S. So it's beauty and hair supply products, personal care products. Um, and so we're getting a lot of benefit from that. Let's see, another question. Um, what would be the best approach in a situation to improve and better position the website? Your, your website is through another party. So I'm not exactly sure when you say your website is through another party. I'm not sure if you have control over the website. Um, but what I would just say is if it's through another party, I think more than anything, if you're working with an agency, you need to have very, be very specific on what metrics do you want to deliver against? Um, you have control, but it's built another org. Yeah. You want to know what metrics you have to deliver against, what things you have to improve. I think in that particular case is just really about, um, understanding what, what you can control, what you can't control. But I think you could lay out an audit yourself to say specifically, here's what we would need to do. So then um, Adam asked, when hiring a company to manage SEO, online lead generation, what are the right questions to ask and how should you hold them accountable for results? That's a great question. So when you are bringing a, an agency to do anything, first and foremost, an agency is always going to tell you um, their KPI, their metrics that they want that, have been, that they've been able to deliver on. It's important that you don't let an agency or anybody else define what metrics that you're going to determine are successful. You need to go to them and say, here are the metrics that I need. When you're talking specifically for SEO, you got to know that it's going to take time for you to be able to see SEO. It's going to take time for you to be able to see the, the improvements in your overall rank. A couple things that you'd want to understand, though, do they understand the on-page tactics and the off-page? Off-page is backlinks. How are they getting backlinks to the site? On-page is how are they structuring your site? 
do they have an audit? Most companies, most SEO companies will do a free audit for you and will tell you a couple of different issues that you have. Um, so I would follow through and look at do that free audit, see what the issues that they have, and, and they should be able to connect it to how you can drive more, more business for yourself. All right, so the question is, um, so I sell traditional Somali bridal dresses and evening wear, business is slow, but now just doing a bit of research, I see that I rank number one in the UK for most keywords, but in the USA I rank lower. Can you explain why and what I can do to improve this? Well, number one is just the different regions are gonna have different search behavior. Um, there's gonna be different keywords that people are likely to search. There might be more things that maybe there's interest. So there's a number of reasons why in one country you could be low and another country that you could be high. Maybe there's less competition or more competition in one region versus the other. Um, what I would recommend um, is you could do uh, an audit yourself um, and just get an idea when you look at your particular website and a competitor's website, you could start to look at the type of keywords that they're using and how you can rank on some of those particular keywords. But the main thing I would do is like I was looking at today, do you have the right page titles? Who's ranking for those, um, for those particular keywords? Do you have the right page titles, H1s, and content that will help to drive people there? Um, not tech savvy to start now. How should I be working on SEO or should I outsource? What metrics will I need to give someone? I'm a sleep consultant, midwife, nurse, and parenting coach. Um, listen, you can, it, it really depends on, so SEO, like the things I showed you today are like the fundamentals, right? It's like, if you can add at a minimum, do the fundamentals of get your page titles right, uh, make sure you have the H1s, N1s, or H1s, H2s, et cetera, you can have those right. You can do that yourself. However, if you're a business owner, you might want to outsource that to somebody. You might want to outsource that to somebody that will help you. And what you would look at is, number one, you would want to look specifically at, you need to look at Google Analytics to be able to see how much traffic are you getting coming into your site organically at the beginning when you start working with them, and how is it later? They'll also give you dashboards. If you work with different agencies, a dashboard that will tell you where you rank now and where you will rank later for particular keywords for particular pages. Oh, okay. So um, ideas for prompts do you recommend to help writers in particular struggle with writing a value proposition for themselves, their business? When you're thinking about, you know, how to write a, a strong value proposition for yourself and your tools, the value proposition has to come, you have to start off with, what are the needs of my customers? So before I do the value proposition, I'd probably create a persona, which would just allow me to say clearly, what are this person's needs and goals? What behaviors do they have in place? Or I'm sorry, what challenges are stopping them from being able to achieve those needs and goals? What behaviors are they now putting in place to overcome some of those challenges? And then you would list demographically who they are. By putting those together, you'll be able to get a much more clear perspective on who your customer is and what value you can actually offer them. As a writer, what value can you offer somebody? A lot of times we struggle because we sit and we just kind of look in on our inside to kind of try to think about things internally, but we need to think consumer centric. When we think consumer centric, we see a, the world the opportunity opens up. How to be as a B2B business in the COVID context. So, you know, realistically, you know, um, whether it's B2B, B2C, you know, businesses are changing how they operate, but they're still buying stuff. They're still hiring consultants. They're still they're like, they're still operating. And so it's really important that you understand that business. What are the things and changes of that person's business? One of the things that we think about when we're marketing is we got to think human to human. Instead of thinking, you know, I'm a business, I'm marketing to a business, who is the individual in that business that you're really marketing to that's in, responsible for making the decisions? Because what are their pressures? What are the things that they need to overcome or those things that they need to do? There may be new needs that they have in this new environment. And so you need to be able to position yourself to be able to answer those needs. So I feel like those brands that have been able to position themselves in a way that says, I recognize your needs are different. It's not business as usual. So let me adapt and adjust and deliver on that. Those businesses is things are working for. Other businesses, they haven't adapted. Um, is there a way to potentially increase advertising from outside companies on your site? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, you, when you're driving way more traffic to your site, see, people want to advertise on sites where people are. And so if you can prove that you have a certain type of person that's relevant to a person, you know, uh, something that a company wants to advertise to, 
one, they're going to be interested. But then when you start to prove the numbers of saying, I have this many people coming to the site of your target, then naturally they're going to want to, then there's an opportunity for them to want to um, advertise there. The other part of that is to be your domain authority. And I don't want to go too far into that, but the domain authority just simply says that there's some sites when they link to you, that they're going to have a way more imp a positive impact on your overall search ranking than other sites. Um, like WebMD versus like Salim's Pharmacy. I don't have a pharmacy, but if I did have a pharmacy, WebMD, them talking about something would go way farther than Salim's Pharmacy talking about something. Um, so it's important to think about that. Um, do website development content-wise, voice want to produce content for other designers and developers, and then offer tutoring consultation. Would that content for that market also help drive my main design development work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, should I focus on content for those small businesses? Just don't know what's relevant to them. All right, so I think the, the question came up, it says somebody does website de design and development for small businesses, um, but they wanna actually get into producing content for designers and developers. In other words, it sounds like teaching them how to do some of the same things that they do. This is an amazing time to do that. This is an amazing time for people who are going back trying to learn better skills. So you can teach people how can you make more money with your time. So you can, as a, you can absolutely come up with content that will be so relevant um, for many of those people. So I think that's a, that's a great idea. Olu said content management is, is an essential ingredient for drives SEO. How to do self auditing on the website. So I'm going to add a tool here. I'm put it in the chat. Screaming frog. Um, you can Google it. It's a audit tool and you can do an audit on your own site and it'll tell you what your page titles are, page descriptions, your headlines, if you have any errors, it'll tell you for every single page on your website. <clears throat> any suggestions on building from the ground up on Facebook or social media platforms? Yes, test and learn, test and learn. Um, when it comes down to you know, social media, when it comes down to digital marketing in general, it's a test and learn environment, which means you could take the opportunity to put stuff out there and then you could see if it works. The good part is if it doesn't work, you could change it an hour later. In fact, um, we just recently for the e-commerce site, I just recently put some ads out there and I saw within an hour, there was certain ads that were doing really well and certain that were not doing well. So in that hour, I took off those ads that weren't doing well. I replaced them with other ads. And over that week, I was constantly updating and optimizing until the end of that week. I came up and I said, these three ads are, are the, the best ads. They're high click through rates, et cetera. Um, and so I took that and then I just was able to push those ads out. And so I definitely think you can. And so Justin says, how do we gauge which keywords we're trying to rank for when it comes to defining content? How do we get stats on what keywords are working and not working? So there's a couple of places. One, you can look in Google Analytics. In Google Analytics, you can actually see um, what's actually driving traffic to your site. You can see terms that are, um, that are people are using to arrive to your site. Also, if you look at... Um, a specific tool when you're thinking about which words that gate when you're trying to pick which keywords use like Google Keyword Planner or Uber Suggest. Those are tools that you can just type in a keyword and it'll give you suggested other keywords. It'll tell you how many people are searching that per month and it'll tell you how competitive that is each month as well. So I would look at that as a start to say which keywords might I want to use as a part of my overall content strategy. Um, however, I would also say there's a few other factors that you might want to consider um, about an individual when you're or about um, keywords that you put into your overall content strategy as well. Um, so the question is just about um, how do we use or are there other tips for using Zoom um, or other video services? She's going to do some um, online video training. Um, for home pain, relief, and wellness, which I think is probably a great idea. Um, you've never coached. So I honestly, I would just say there's a bunch of tools like tips. You can go on, on Zoom, I'm sorry, on YouTube and just look up. I would literally just look up tips for creating a killer webinar, or tips for creating um, a killer online course or tips for you know, managing a video, video service. Um, and they'll give you some really good tips there. Um, anything um, that Facebook and Instagram business related tips that could be applied for advertising um, this keyword work in Facebook and Instagram too. So um, when it comes to the keywords, you know, in Facebook and Instagram, not, it's not the same. The approach that I was talking about when you think, when I think about keywords is understanding a person's search intent, what information are they looking for? The difference with um, search and um, 
social media is that in social media, I'm not there for, I'm there to engage with people, to learn new things, to, to talk to people, get updates on things, et cetera. And I might, as a result of that, see an image or a post and say, oh, wow, that's dope. Click on it. And now I'm interested. When I'm searching, I'm literally typing into the search engine, give me an answer to this particular question. Help me find this information. And so when you do that and you're literally typing that in there, you're that like that's where the keyword comes and it says, oh, this is what they're looking for. It's an indication of the type of information that they're looking for. So it doesn't work the exact same way when it comes to Facebook or Instagram, um, but they can absolutely links from there can help your search. Um, when you think about Facebook and Instagram related tips, yeah, I think the, the, the main thing I would say is goes back to value. Make, what value are you offering your customers? Are you just telling them stuff because that's what you think are benefits? Or are you truly offering them value or helping them to navigate this certain circumstance? Are you helping them to make more money? Are you helping them to do things faster, easier, cheaper? Are you educating them, informing them? Think about that content marketing honeycomb and you can use that to help give you way more compelling Facebook ads as well as organic content or Instagram content or LinkedIn content that you can put out. Well, um, if I got all the questions, then just the last slide is one. Uh, here's my contact information. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me, Salim Holder, on LinkedIn. Check me out on our website. If you have any questions, you can also send me an email, salim at findyourplug.com. Um, and Fiverr has also been nice enough to offer an opportunity for you to get 25% off um, a web, uh, the digital marketing fundamentals. So if some of this stuff was relevant to you, or if you're new, or if you're really um, at the beginning of, of doing some marketing, digital marketing fundamentals can be an amazing course for you to get a better understanding of, of the basics, the fundamentals, and how to approach your business, how to grow your business, how to look at your competition, define your value proposition. And it will even take you through some specific and different tactics and best practices for using some of those tactics. Um, I will let, let it is a marketing fundamentals course. Um, so it's basic level. So you just have to kind of gauge what level you're at. But this is definitely a course that has received quite a bit of positive feedback. It's only $40, I think $41 and you get 25% off. So um, take your time and, and, and learn more. Otherwise, um, I appreciate everybody's time today. And hopefully you got out of here what you had expected to get out of the conversation. Thank you very much, Salim, and thank you everyone for participating uh, and uh, hope to see you in our next webinar. Thank you.